tough guy girl, Michelle Rodriguez is a current, currently one of the best examples of tough guy, tough girl. Hilary Swank co comes in to this role um, at times, and then we have the bumbling hero and heroine, and Kirst Kristen Wiig is a great example, um, Isla Fisher also, great examples. So understand that and remember that, that the purpose of typecasting is to be able to look at an actor and uh, estimate their box office draw. It's for the same reason economics, minimizing risk, budgeting and marketing to increase profit. So that concludes this part of the lecture. Again, with all these lectures, there is a quiz that follows. Thank you. Hello class, welcome to part two of the genre discussion. So this is for the Mars Me Arts and Studies program at Cuyahoga Community College, course 1020. In discussing the genres, we're looking through what you read in chapter two of Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat. What he calls genre, you can see I've put a slash through it. We're actually gonna understand them to be story arcs. He's not talking about these genres here. And while he kind of gives an introduction of supplanting these traditional genres with what, what, what he's understanding as genre, he's actually incorrect. That these genres are dealing with the entire film, with conventions that the entire film uses to be in a particular genre. So in an action film, yes, we're gonna have a certain story convention. We're usually gonna have a handsome hero from our type uh, casting. We're usually going to have them with a life or death situation. There's usually going to be explosions and excitement, fight choreography, combat that we're going to see in an action film. But they're also cinematic and that's what we understand in art of story. We want to know those conventions because right now we are at the story development stage, the pre-production and development stage. But as that film moves in, it's going to maintain, moves into the other stages of production, it's going to maintain that it is in the action genre. So it's going to be shot a certain way. There will be certain camera angles, and we'll do this as we move into storyboarding, but there are going to be certain camera angles that you're going to maintain too. There are certain lighting that you're going to do. For an action film, you're usually with wide camera angles. You're not using extreme close-ups. You're usually using movement in, a, in an action film to follow the action. Your lighting is usually brightly lit. It's going to have low contrast. You're going to have your darks and your lights are pretty much going to be in the same range. Not a lot of contrast, low contrast. Those are the cinematic elements of action, of the genre of action. Your editing is going to be straightforward. You're not going to do a lot of non-linear editing within a scene. You're really going to edit your scene within the linear structure so that we can best understand the action that's going on. So everything from your lighting, your camera angles, your actor's performances, and your editing are all going to be a part of this type of genre, which is action. Genre refers to the entire film, not just the story. Blake Snyder, however, gives us categorizations that are only understanding the story, that are only concerned with the story. The monster category that he gives us doesn't have anything to do with how it's shot. He tells us that it's about, as you've read, it's about something foreign coming into the story space, to a very specific and even confined space, and then that terrorizing the main character. That has nothing to do with how it's shot. That's why for my examples, I've given you things that cross genres to show how his story arcs are really concerned with the character and the development of the story and not concerned with the lighting, the camera, the sound, the editing, all the other things that our genre is concerned with. So I've given for Monster, Jaws, which is a horror film. Falls right in here with horror. I'm going to take this example to also talk about the point that I made earlier about avoiding hybrid genres. Monster, Snyder gives an example, as you read, of Aliens. Aliens is a horror film. Aliens is not a science fiction film. Yes, it takes place in a science fiction arena, 
but it's not concerned with the science fiction. In, in the film Aliens, the characters are not trying to find the DNA code that will break down and destroy the alien. They're not trying to find the alien's home planet by using a sequences of properties of this alien. What oxygen does it breathe? How is the alien's skin? If it has a viscous skin, does that mean that it had, it, it's from a watery climate? You know, those kind of things. They're not using anything that has science fiction elements to it to really be concerned with the mainstay of the film. They are simply running away, trying to save their life from a monster, from a horror. And that is why it is steeped completely in the horror film with science fiction elements. You won't call it a hybrid, you'll say it's a horror film with science fiction elements. And that's it. So moving back to the point of this lecture, which is we have a monster in Jaws, then we also have a monster in Up in the Air. This is the George Clooney film in which he plays a man who flies around to different countries, to different cities, firing them, laying them off from their company. So a company's hired a third party company, that third party company is going to come in, evaluate the company, and then do layoffs. It's George Clooney's part to deliver the unhappy information. George Clooney's world is very nice for him. He enjoys that he is up in the air most of the time, that he has nothing that holds him down that anchors him. The monster is a new employee that comes in with a new way of firing people. She's going to use the internet, and that is going to destroy George Clooney's world. So here we still have the monster storyline, but we have it in a comedy as opposed to a horror film. So is it going to be shot the same way Jaws is shot? No. Is the soundscape going to be the same as Jaws? No. Is it going to have character performances the same as Jaws? No. The only thing it has in common with Jaws is this story arc. And the two of them have the same task. Story-wise, they must show that this monster will destroy the world of the characters. So for Jaws, they spend much time saying the summer and the beach vacation culture will be done because of this shark invasion. And it's a tug of war between the main character to get the antagonist to agree to close the beach because of this shark. The antagonist does not want the world. It's clear that this monster will destroy the world that they live in, this beach town, that they will destroy the beach culture. And that's why he doesn't want to shut it down. Same thing happening in Up in the Air. It's very clear that this new employee will destroy Joyce Clooney's world of being able to fly where he wants to fly and to have many flight experiences where he doesn't live most of his life in one place. Now that he can fire people through the internet, he's now stuck. He's anchored to living in one city, in his house, in one town, and just reaching out through the internet. So it's very, both of these scripts have the same task, to prove to the audience that the monster is going to ruin the world. And that is what we're looking at when we're in the scripting stage. We, these tools are extremely helpful for us, and these understandings of these story arcs are extremely helpful, because when we look back at our outline, we're able to actually see. What do I need to do? What do I need to work on? Where do I need to tweak something? If I'm in Golden Fleece, as you read, Golden Fleece is about a particular object with which the main character will be invincible. And we have to do the task of in writing that story of truly making that object one in which it's plausible and believable to the audience that this character will be invincible. That even in this character's own mind, he or she will be invincible. One of the brilliance of Lord of the Rings as an example of the Golden Fleece is that J.R. Um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, when he wrote the book, he developed a golden fleece object with which we know you will be invincible. With that seventh ring, one ring to rule them all, you know that with that ring you will be all powerful in this particular world and it must be destroyed. And that is a brilliant turn that J.R.R. Tolkien makes that Peter Jackson is uh, loyal to when he makes the films. In, in an irony that instead of the Golden Fleece being something to hold and then have, the Golden Fleece is something to spend the entire story arc trying to destroy. The opposite is happening in, in Ocean's Eleven. Ocean Eleven is more traditional Golden Fleece in which this money st that will be stolen from the casino will make George Clooney's character invincible. His life will be perfect. His life will be remedied. And he believes that. So when Steven Soderbergh develops this film, he has to make sure that what, that what they're going after, we're going to spend the next two hours or an hour and a half 
watching characters pursue this one object, we have to believe and be invested that that object is absolutely, truly what this character will need and will make them invincible or happy or remedy their life. And he successfully does that in Ocean's Eleven. These two films are of different genres. Lord of the Rings is fantasy, adventure. And Ocean's Eleven is heist. It falls into the comedy uh, section. So that's where we're getting different, um, different genres, but the same story arc. And it's a tool that we can use. Out of the Bottle, Midnight in Paris is Woody Allen's film in which the main character is um, transported to the 1920s to this sort of period in Paris that he has elevated in his mind as being the hotbed of culture and writing and art and understanding of the world that we really live in. And the main character goes there every night at midnight. It's out of the bottle because it's something that, um, that transforms. It's a one particular moment that transforms the main character, but it's temporary. It's a ticking clock. That transformation will end. And then the main character is left with, will he remain changed from the experience? Will he see that he didn't need the mechanism that came out of the bottle to really affect his change, that it was something inside of himself that he needed to affect the change? Synecdoche, New York by Charlie Kaufman is the similar concept. He receives a grant that, that takes, his, takes him out of the bottle. It's something that comes out and transforms his world. The main character played by Philip Seymour Hoffman in Synecdoche, New York, allows him to create a replica of New York. And then he, it allows him as a stage, as, as sort of a performance art piece. And then he casts someone to play himself. And then he casts someone to play that person, playing him, him playing himself. And so it, all of a sudden, this sort of transformed world that he gets to delve into begs the question of when this grant runs out, when this project is over, will he still be changed? And so that's what's happening out of the bottle. As you read, examples that Snyder gave is liar, liar. Again, it's a temporary spell that's put over Jim Carrey's character. He can't lie anymore. And when that spell is over, will he really be changed? Will he be an honest person? So the, temp the key thing to remember with out of the bottle, when you ask yourself, what story arc are you dealing with? And this you're usually asking yourself when you're in the revision stage. When you're, or, or you may ask it when you're outlining, before you actually plot out your story or as you're plotting out your story before you begin scripting, you'll ask yourself, which one of these story arcs? If as you're mining your imagination, asking questions of your imagination, you arrive at that you are on an out-of-the-bottle story arc, then you want to make sure that this period, this transformation that your main character is experiencing is temporary, that it will end, and then your character will be left with, did, can, did they make that transformation themselves? Now that the temporary magical element, and that magical element could be, as in Midnight in Paris, truly a magical unexplained event. It could be explained in Synecdoche, New York. It is the element of winning the grant. The grant money is what allows him to do something that is unusual, that allows him to temporarily go into this world and transform. In Liar Liar, it's a magical change. It's a wish that his, that his son makes. Other out-of-the-bottle examples are Nutty Professor. So it's a scientific out of the bottle. It's a potion that the character creates in uh, Jerry Lewis's uh, Nutty Professor, and I believe it's the same in Eddie Murphy's version, that there's a potion that the professor creates. He drinks that, and that transforms him. The question also at the end of Nutty Professor is will the transformation that he went through and experienced because of this particular mechanism, has it been internalized? Does the character now know and learn that he can manifest that tra transformation himself? He doesn't need an external force to do it. But to know that, to question that, it must be temporal. The out-of-the-bottle transformation must come to an end. Do with the problem. Space Odyssey. This is um, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. And yes, our character has a very real problem. He has this computer, Hal, that is malfunctioning. And because of the malfunction that Hal is going through, the main character will die. The life support will be shut down and the main character will die on the spaceship. It is a dude with a problem because the problem is large. The problem is usually life or death. It can end this person's life or it will end other people's lives. Your problem should be large. It should be huge. Donnie Darko is a dude with a problem. It is the storyline of someone who knows the day that the world will end. So again, it's a big 
big problem. It's a problem with a lot of ripple effect. It's a problem that usually is going to be life or death for the main character or for people the character knows. 